Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the promise of your presence when we gather, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord, you promised us. If it goes out, it will not return, Lord, Lord. And we will claim that promise, Lord. Let your word go out, Lord, let it work in my heart. Just thank you for filling me up today. Thank you for Sunday school hour. Thank you for Sunday school teaching. Preachers, worship team, Lord. We just, we're so blessed. We're blessed to God.
may be seated. Was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you. Broke my 
ladies and young ladies and musicians so much for just uh, preparing our hearts for worship. I pray that today you've come and we've worshiped through our giving and through our faithfulness and through our singing and now uh, through God's word, a very important part of our worship to come and respond uh, to him. If you have your Bibles in Judges chapter number 6 is where we'll take our text uh, from. Uh, one verse that caught my attention, Judges chapter 6 verse number uh, 21, and if you're visiting with us, or you'll see the ladies gathering up children. Come on, Wayla. That's what I'm talking about, fella. Uh, man, yeah. He's got a pep in his step. He's been to the barber shop. So, uh, yeah, make sure we get uh, <laughs> matching bows coming down the aisle here. Yeah. <laughs> How precious. So if you have your Bibles in uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 21, one verse caught my attention, <coughs> I hadn't thought about it, excuse me, <coughs> much before, but <coughs> angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh of unleavened cakes, there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord <coughs> departed out of his sight. There's one word here that God spoke to me as I was reading over and prepping this week, and that one word was fire. And the more I dug into this verse, the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh, the unleavened cakes, and there rose fire out of the rock. What in the world does fire? This is obviously the call of Gideon. If you read chapter 6, you will understand that the uh, children of Israel has been in captivity for seven years. If you read the first part of chapter 6, you'll see the Mennonites come across, and they come across as all these camels in the desert, and they attack, and they just absolutely rape the land. They take everything. They take all the vegetables. They take all the herbs, if you will, the earth. They take all the fruits. They take all the uh, donkeys. They take all the cows. They take all the sheep. They take everything, and you find the children of Israel, many of them are scattered, and they're living in caves, scared for their lives, all their land is gone, everything has been ransacked, and now we find Gideon. And when you find Gideon at first, he's there in the wine press, in other words, in a cellar trying to thresh wheat where there's no wind. And the Bible says he did that to hide it from the Mennonites because obviously they would steal it if they saw him. And now this man, he does not know it's an angel of the Lord, comes and calls him and says, Gideon, God's going to use you to deliver uh, the children of Israel. God's going to use you to deliver uh, the children, his people from the Mennonites, and he calls him old man of valor. Now at this point, Gideon does not know this is an angel of the Lord. When you see this right here, after this verse, verse 22, then he recognizes he's the angel. But here in verse 21, when the angel, basically Gideon went and he brought an offering to this man or this messenger, if you will, and when fire hit, right there it should tell you and I one thing, the presence of God was with Gideon. Fire always represents the presence of God when you're reading God's Word, dealing with God's man or God's woman in the Bible. If you read, you recall, all of us know the story of Moses in the burning bush. There's fire there. No doubt God's presence was with Moses. If it's Ezekiel, he described the Holy One as the appearance of fire. Brightness all around. Daniel's vision was a fiery flame around his throne. Zechariah described the Lord as a wall of fire round about. At the day of Pentecost, the cloven tongues that fell that set upon them was like fire. And we all know the story of Elijah. There were the altar when they sapped it full of water. He cried and God sent fire from heaven. Fire is always symbolic of the presence of God in your life. Now this is dealing with the Old Testament. So for you and I spiritually, the presence of God evermore living within us is based on our feeling of the Word of God or our fellowship with God. And so my question is, as I begin to write, here we find Gideon and the presence of God showed up on this rock. Then I want to know, Ray, in my life, is God's presence with me? And if I haven't felt the presence of God in my life, if I feel far from God, I feel like there's definitely no presence of God around me or with me or walking with me or in the morning when I wake up, then what is the problem? Why am I a child of God? I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I've put my faith and trust in Him, but I don't feel His presence, Stan. 
No doubt Gideon was a child of God. No doubt Gideon was God's man. But here on the, in, the, uh, in the cellar, if you will, here in the basement, God's presence is far from him. He no longer feels the presence of God. If you read there, you'll see him questioning, why is all this happening? What happened to the God of our fathers? A man that has a question, what happened to the God of our fathers, sure does not feel the presence of God in his life. So how did he lose the presence of God? And if you feel so far from God, what can we learn about Gideon that I can apply to my life spiritually? I want to make sure I'm living in the presence of God. So how do I do that? Well, Gideon did, and, and I've got my outline here. It'll take me two services to preach through this, so uh, tonight we'll be back at 6 o'clock, but th- I'm just going to preach one point with a few subpoints this morning. The very first thing for you and I, you go seven years. If you read there, you'll see the children of Israel have been seven years. They've been, the country's been in a great depression, if you will, discouraged. Everything is gone, but it's been seven years. A horrible seven years. A seven-year walk that is unpleasant. A seven-year ordeal no one wants to go through. And then we come to verse 21 and the presence of God shows up. For you, I don't know how long your walk has been. I don't know how long your valley's been. Forgetting it was seven years, for you it may be one week, it may be seven years, it may be 25 years, it may be 50 years. But it's an unpleasant walk. And you sure have not been able to experience the presence of God. Get in seven years. I don't know how long it's been for you, friend, but how do I get the presence of God back in my life? The very first thing, Shane, is number one, you've got to start responding to the message. Responding to the message. You see, certain messages make us respond. If we want to. If you want to. Responding to the message depends on if I like the message or not. Right, Kobe? So Kobe saved my life Friday. Right, Kobe? You did, right? Kobe was dispatching, and I got flagged down by a motorist in the middle of the road. A game morning stopped a car, and he's just flagging me down. I'm like, oh, here we go. So I pull over there. It's a young lady gripping the steering wheel, Ted, obviously in pain. Casually, I walk up thinking, you know, it's usually a drunk that I'm dealing with, right? I'm like, hey, ma'am, what's wrong? She said, I think my water broke. That is a message that will cause an immediate response in my life. I don't know about y'all. I'm like, I said, okay, just remain calm. Now, if you ladies has had contractions, you can't remain calm. But she was like climbing the stairs. Well, I'm like, just try to remain calm. I called up, Colby answered. I said, hey, man, I need an ambulance like ASAP, right? I'm not delivering a baby today, and this ambulance, I'm just praying they're not on another run. Y'all know Prince County don't have that many ambulances, right? Kobe said, hey, Elf one they're in route. I'm like, I said, hey, letting you know, the ambulance is coming. You know, just hold on. I said, uh, what? She said, my baby doctor was Tuesday and everything was fine. I'm like, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. A lot can happen in 72 hours is what I'm like. I said, how many children you have? She said, this is the third one. I'm thinking, she's already been through this. She's going to be an expert by now. This is, gonna, this is not going to take long in my mind. I'm like, okay, just remain calm, just remain calm. What else can I do? What else can I do, right? Like, if it was any other thing, I would know what to do. I know how to rest people. I know how to do this, but I'm just like, I heard that ambulance. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. They're like, what's going on? I don't know. She needs to ride with y'all, though, right? And uh, I said, hey, give me your mother's phone number. She gave me her mother's phone number. Uh, so uh, after she got loaded in the ambulance, I called her mother, and as soon as it started ringing, y'all know what I forgot, because I was a little distraught. I didn't know her mother's name. She answered, hello. I'm like, who am I speaking to? She's like, who'd you call? <laughs> I'm like, uh, is your daughter pregnant by chance? She's like, who is this? I said, this is Ray with the Mississippi Highway Patrol. Is your daughter pregnant? She said, yeah. I said, okay, I'm on the side of the road with the ambulance. I don't want to tow your car. Car's in the middle of the road. Can I come get you? She said, yeah. She lived nearly at New Albany. I thought she lived in Boomwood. That's where I was, right? So run, pick her up, run back. I said, text me whatever you want to text me, but just let me know things. You might want to name the baby MHP, right? I already, I already went through names with her while I was trying to calm her down. Like, what are we going to name this baby? You know, we're just going through stuff. Then she tells said, no baby today. Water didn't break. <laughs> I've never had a baby or been pregnant. <laughs> what happened, women? Is that not something that's obvious, right? I, I don't know the process. I don't know. I, I, anyway, so she's, uh, the mama's still doing good. Uh, 
but uh, on the side note, I would that might be a little mission project for us because uh, it's it, not a good situation. It's definitely for diapers and clothes and stuff like that. So, but I respond as soon as I heard that message. I responded to it. I mean, as soon as I, I told Kenny one night I was roadblocking in Tupelo for us, a guy pulled up. I see him coming. He just pulls over the side of the road and puts it in park. I walk over, he said, ain't no sense lying about it. I'm drinking and driving. Ain't no sense. I just thought I'd go ahead and pull over, save you from having to tell me pull over. <laughs> That's the kind of person I like in my life, just honest. And he wasn't even drunk. I tested him, I'm like, how much you had? Well, I've only had one. I tested him, I said, man, you're, you're, you're good to drive. You just, you know, and he's like, I, ain't no sense of trying to hide it. I just went ahead and pulled over, save you a lot of time, right? Those are messages I respond to. Now, we can respond if somebody says, my water broke. I mean, everybody in here can respond to that. And my wife was sweet enough to say, well, I'm sure she didn't want to have that baby when she saw you if she knew how you handled my pregnancy. She's like, "Uh uh-uh, not him. He won't even be concerned about it. I'm like, what? But there's a partial truth in that statement. Anyway, I'm like, we all respond to different messages. So why can we respond to someone saying their water broke And we can't respond to the God of the universe and press it on your heart to get things off your heart, to give him your load, to give him your life. Why is it so hard? The reason even as children of God that have been born again, we feel so far from God and the presence of God is not just absolutely evident in our life, is even us, we don't respond to the message. So how do you respond to the message? Well, the very first thing I notice as I'm reading this and studying, first thing that Gideon did, uh, the man said, hey, God's going to use you to deliver the country. God's going to use you to do this. God's going to use you to do this. And he says, hey, will you please stay here and wait just a second? And we come to verse 19. Listen to what verse 19 says. <clears throat> and Gideon went in and made ready a kid, a small goat, unleavened cakes, an ephod, a flour, the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and he brought it out under the oak and presented it to him. In other words, he gave him an offering. The very first thing that you and I have to do is we've got to bring whatever offering there is that's keeping us from God, we bring it. You say, well, Ray, what in, uh, you mean there's something that's standing between Gideon and God? Why in the world are you saying whatever's keeping me from God, you've got to bring Do you not think a baby goat that Gideon's been hiding, no telling how long, was probably the most precious thing he had as far as commodity? Do you not think wheat to make bread? He's just been threshing wheat and he was trying to keep it hidden from the uh, Midianites because he didn't want them to steal it. So obviously all the things hidden in his life, he was willing to bring out and give to this messenger but he didn't give it to the messenger because he was in awe of the messenger. He gave it to the messenger because of the message he responded to. It's not the messenger. It's all about the message. And so he gives until you realize the Word of God has become the most dear thing in your life. You will never experience God. Gideon was moved to give up what meant the most to him, what he had in hiding, and simply come clean with God and say, hey, this is all I have. This is everything to me, but I'm willing to give it. I'm afraid some of us never experience God and we will never feel His presence because we still continue to hold the things that are keeping us back from God. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you will have to give up what you love more than you love Him. Social media, hobbies, TVs, ball games, laziness, you name it. Until you're willing to give that up, the presence of God is not going to be felt or experienced in your life. It's quite simple. You name it. If it becomes between you and God, you must give it up to experience God. Gideon was willing to sacrifice a meal. They're hard to come by. He had his baby goat. You read verse 4. The Midianites had already destroyed everything, left no substance, no livestock, and yet he's willing to give what he has. I don't know how long he's kept this goat. I don't know how he hid this goat. But somehow he had a goat and he knew it and he was willing to give it up. Mm. So if responding to the Word of God is your first step to experiencing God, then that response should require you to bring an offering or a sacrifice of your life. The second, in verse 24, 
God's word goes on to say, Gideon built an altar. After the fire or the presence of God showed up, we get to verse 24, then Gideon built an altar there in the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom, and to this day is yet an Ophrah of the Abrazites. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace is what Jehovah Shalom means. The God of peace. Listen very carefully. The word of God says the most important thing to Gideon wanted, he wanted to remember was the peace of God. You see, altars were built in the Old Testament for sacrifices. We, we, we put sacrifices on them, but that's not what this altar is built for. This altar is built just like Joshua. It was for memorial. People built altars to commemorate times that they had experienced God. Gideon builds an altar com to commemorate or to remember a time that he experienced God, and he called it Jehovah Shalom. What's special about this is God has told him, the message has told him, hey, you're going to go and you're going to win this battle. You're going to fight the Midianites. You're going to run them out. You're going to rescue the people of Israel. In other words, Gideon is facing battle. He's facing the anxiety. He's facing the unknowns. But before he even goes, he begins to cry out, Jehovah Shalom will be with me. In other words, you and I, when we face those uncircumstances or those unknown circumstances, when we face the hardest and the most difficult battles of our life, if you go into it knowing God has already told you, I will be with you. I'm already waiting on the other side. We build this memorial. Jehovah Shalom is with me. I will not fear. I'm ready to go on whatever mission trip. The peace of God overshadows me so that the peace of God comes over me and it begins to influence my decision making and it begins to influence my thought process and no matter what battle I'm going in, no matter what battle I lies before me, I have peace that God is with me. My goodness. Jehovah Shalom, the peace of God will see you through. What I'm saying today, church, if you're ever going to experience the presence of God and you get rid of what's keeping you between you and God, then you've got to start looking and realizing no matter the battle, no matter how bad things are in your life, no matter the turmoil, you've still got to realize the God of peace promises to be with you. And it sets a different tune in your life. There was Jehovah Shalom when Gideon cut his army. And we'll talk about that tonight. There was Jehovah Shalom when David was tossed in the lion, Daniel was tossed in the lion's den. There was Jehovah Shalom when Esther opened the door of the king. There was Jehovah Shalom when Peter began praising God in the jailhouse at midnight. There was Jehovah Shalom when Peter went to sleep before his execution, waking up on the outside of the gates. And I say this. Very, very concerning. There was Jehovah Shalom in my life when I got on a crop duster and watched the flight attendant start praying on takeoff. Is this plane safe? I've never seen a flight attendant sit down in front of me and start praying. She knows something I don't know. <laughs> She's probably like, yeah, I know Jehovah Shalom. You obviously don't. No, I'm just kidding. Right? I mean, Jehovah Shalom is with you. There's Jehovah Shalom in my life when God impressed on me to go to Ghana to build a home. There's Jehovah Shalom when God gave me peace to even move to Marietta and build a house. Every step of my walk with God, no matter how difficult and I can't understand, God has proven to give me peace that passes all understanding. Zach, Jehovah Shalom. God is with your mom already. Already. Mr. Gary, before you went to the doctor, Mr. Gary had a procedure to get his heart working again. I'm just kidding. Get his heart back into rhythm. Do you know before it ever got out of rhythm, Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, was walking with you. Jehovah Shalom. Courtney, you and Keegan just gave us a card. Pop's passing. Jehovah Shalom is there. Peace I give you. A while back, you probably saw Facebook, Melinda and John Michael expecting a child, and God had different plans. Jehovah Shalom, there every step. His plans are perfect. His plans are perfect. We may not understand them while we're walking through that battle, but when His peace through His presence encamps around you, <laughs> I'm ready to go to battle because He's already promised to give me the victory. Gideon wanted 
to be reminded every day. A memorial is to remind me every day. Jehovah Shalom is with me. And I have peace. I have peace. Jehovah Shalom. You may not be experiencing God because you have stopped remembering God is the giver of peace, not the author of confusion. But you've got to give it to Him. God will deliver you or bring you through, but friend, His name is a promise. Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. The same God that brought fire from heaven to consume the offering is the same God that could have brought fire from heaven to consume the Midianites. But that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was to take Gideon to rescue the children of Israel from the Mennonites. But he promised, hey, you will be victorious. Remember, I'm with you. If Gideon would have slammed the, the book here, the Word of God, and said, no, I give up. No, God's not around. No. Then obviously the children of Israel would still be oppressed. You see, it takes a man or woman to know that God's moving in your life and willing to step up and hear the message and respond to it. Many of you, the message is get rid of what's keeping you from me. That's the first thing. Others have forgot who God is. I, we just had a good Sunday school class this morning. I was in there and we were talking about being pessimistic and optimistic. And how, uh, Ted, if you listen to yourself, you'll become pessimistic. If you preach to yourself, you can't help but be optimistic about the day. Period. So it's preaching to yourself, not listening to yourself, because your flesh will lead you astray. You say, I'm tired, I don't want to do that. I don't want to study my Bible, I don't pray, I'm too tired, I need to go to bed. That's your flesh talking to you. Preaching to yourself. Now you have the first message there, Jack. Jehovah Shalom is with me. Every day you preach Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. Like I said, some of you have walked through a three-year battle. Some of you have walked through a year battle. Some of you walked through some unpleasant times in the last few years of your life. I ask you to build a memorial today so that every step you're reminded Jehovah Shalom is with me. So, a memorial, Jehovah Shalom, to remember. An offering to put what's keeping me from God so that I may, God may know that I'm sincere about His message. And the third thing comes from verse 25 and 26. He simply broke free. Publicly living for, Je uh, for Jesus. He broke free. Look at verse 25 and verse 26. The very first thing God says, It came to pass the same night the Lord said to him, Take thy father's young bullet, even the, seven, uh, the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath. Cut down the grove that is by it. Build an altar in the Lord that God, uh, that <coughs> thy God upon the, upon the top of this rock. In the ordered place, take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. So God has ordered Gideon the very first thing. Not the battle. We've got to go out and face this, uh, uh, this army of several hundred thousands. No, I don't want you to do that first. I'm preparing you. The very first thing I want you to do is I want you to go and just absolutely cut down these groves, a place of worship, cut down all these idols. That's what I want you to do. I, I've had a good talk with uh, Rachel here lately. Uh, she and I spent about, I called and talked to Ben. This is Ben and Rachel in Ghana. I called and talked to Ben. I got Rachel and, and she and I began, she began telling me stories. In, the, in Ghana when I was there, there was like 25 women in the church and two men. One of them was the preacher. Well, I count myself. So it's four of us, me and Ben and then another guy and a preacher, right? Uh, so and she, the, the faith there works by action, not by words. Shouldn't that really work universal? And she was telling me about they've been praying for this young lady's husband. And there you have many wives. And it's just a total different culture. They worship many things. But she said, we're praying and we're praying. Our Friday night Bible studies grew from, our Friday evening Bible studies grew from just a handful and kept growing to like 20. Anyway, they baptized 40 people this year through that Bible study that led to even men coming. And she said, 
she was talking about how awesome God is that one of the men they've been praying for and praying for, he come, he finally darkened the doors of the church and then he left the church and went home and threw out all of his idols. In other words, it's the picture of Gideon said, everything that's around me, I want to publicly commit to the Lord and the way you publicly commit to the Lord, you get rid of everything that is ungodly in your spiritual life. You throw it out. Gideon said, I don't want it around my children. I don't want it in my community. I don't want it around all my peers. I want to get rid of it. And so he goes and he tears down all these idols and he stacks it up. And I really like this. The Bible said he took a bull. A bull would have been like a cow in India. A very sacred. The bull was the god of Baal. It was the god. It, it, it stood. It was symbolic of the god of fertility. The animal that represented Baal was a bull. And guess what God said? Take a bull and offer it upon all those other idols and you consume them, you burn them so everyone knows what you're saying is I don't care if you're worse than Baal I don't care I'm going to sacrifice and show you publicly that today I am no longer in bondage and you will keep no one else in bondage. That Baal is a false god that's leading to death, but Jehovah Shalom is the God that's leading to life. Today I'm announcing, I'm committing to the Lord Jesus Christ publicly. The reason many of us don't experience God's presence is we profess it privately, but we don't serve Him publicly. Big reasons. Nobody knew God had called Gideon. It was just him and the angel of the Lord. Nobody knew Gideon had offered a sacrifice. Just him and the Lord. Nobody knew Gideon had made a memorial to commemorate the presence of God in his life except Gideon. But old friend, you can't read chapter 6 without realizing the whole town knew Gideon was committed to the Lord because they were wanting to kill him because he'd throw down all the idols, sacrificed a bull. Wow. You say, well, Ray... I believe in Jesus, so I'm saved. I believe in Muhammad, Muhammad Ali also. I watch him on TV. I believe he's a person. I believe in him. I believe in George Bush. I believe he's a person. I believe in him. But believing in a man and committed to a man is two different things. And I'm afraid there's a lot of people who will bust hell wide open by saying they believe in Jesus Christ. Because a belief that don't produce action, commitment, is not a belief. It's hypocrisy. So today, the presence of God seems far from you. I'm going to ask you, whatever you're, that you've been hiding, you give back to Him. Here, Father, I lay it down. I desire your presence. If today, not only are those things that you've been hiding, but you forgot who God is, Jehovah Shalom, and you're walking around with a puppy dog face and a Debbie Downer attitude that life is horrible. You forgot Jehovah Shalom. You forgot. There should be memorials every step of your path reminding you, preaching to yourself who God is. I ask you today to start calling out Jehovah Shalom. And today, if you are not publicly committed to Jesus Christ, you may not be feeling His presence because you're different out there than you are in here. And you may just be like me, 23 years of my life, where I said I believed in Jesus, but it was only words, Kobe. No action. Maybe the reason you don't feel the presence of God in your life is because you're not a child of God and you're holding on to a baptism, a Sunday school class, joining a church, or what I did, what my family and parents said about me, that I was a Christian. 
not by my actions. I beg you today, don't leave this place without knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I beg you today, you've never experienced God's presence in your life. You may not be a child of God. I beg you today. Oh yeah, it takes swallowing your pride. I ain't no doubt. But I'd rather swallow my pride in this little vapor of life bust hell stand for an eternity knowing that God was impressed. remember what I said about responding to the message absolutely I beg you just simply respond to the message if you don't know what in the world like what does that even look like I promise by faith if you just come say, brother Ray I, I need to give my life to Jesus simple it's simple but it's a lifetime commitment for this vapor and then in eternity. Nothing like having peace. Fathers, you'll never be able to father. Moms, you'll never be able to, to mother without the love of Christ here. Would you bow with me? Lord, all across this building, you know hearts that I don't know. There might be someone sitting here that's been here for many years, Father. And you know, God, that their salvation is based on their words, not based on a relationship with you. There may be others here, Father. They may have only been here for a few minutes, maybe even a few days, a few months. Likewise, you know their heart. And God, there may be people that have, uh, Lord, they may be grandparents, they may be senior citizens. They've never given their heart to you. They've held on. They believe in you. But that's as far as it goes. A belief with no action. It's like faith with no action, no works. It's dead. I pray today that they'd come alive. They'd come alive. Father, forgive us of more we failed you. Let us be obedient to your words today. Pour ourselves out before you at this altar. We love you today. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, and all of us said, Amen. Would you stand with me, church? Do you truly know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you don't, I beg you, don't leave here. Maybe you'd just like to come and recommit yourself and say, boy, I haven't felt his presence. God's given you the message. Would you respond?
with me, Father, as we continue, God, just a time of prayer and pouring our hearts out before you, God. Again, God, I I ask, Father, that we pray the ones that may be standing beside us, left or right. Right now, God, we'd come together as a faith family and begin to pray for each other. Pray for the cares, the concerns, the needs. God, that one that may be struggling this morning spiritually, I pray, Father, for them. God, you know who they are. God, hear our cries. God, you heard the children of Israel cries and sent Gideon. God, as we cry out to you, I know your sweet spirit begins to dwell upon us. Move upon us. Let us respond, God. We love you today. Forgive us some more we fail you. In Jesus' name, and all of us said, let's sing one more verse, church. Would you sing with me? God's people sin. Amen and amen. Church, please don't leave. If uh, Man, if there's some spiritual battles going on, need to talk to someone, I'll be at the back of the church. Youth, don't forget, 3.30. Uh, we may need to check some of you, uh, if uh, parents or adults are going, we need to check with Doug and Amy, make sure we're good on rides, because uh, we'll have to caravan down there. Also, <clears throat> be praying for our youth. We've got a youth retreat coming up in March. Uh, they're making plans for youth camp. Uh, so we'll probably have to do some fundraising, maybe get the youth, turn our, our INAM Center into a restaurant, let them wait on us, uh, so be the, uh, only, uh, uh, be the only restaurant on County Road 4050, so it'll be a fun time uh, for them to come and serve us and things like that. It'll be a little good fundraiser. Don't forget tonight, we start back at 6 o'clock unless you go to Winter Gym. They leave here at 3.30. If you'd like to go, if you'd like to help uh, carry kids, get up with Doug and Amy. Uh, Doug, raise your hand, man. Right there is where Doug's sitting. If you'd say, hey, I'd be more willing to go and help tonight. Uh, They need all the help uh, they can get, not only tonight, but all the time. Please make uh, them aware that you're there willing to help them. All right, church, (coughs) anything, you are at liberty to go. See you tonight at 6. Thank you for the help, young ladies. Thank you.